the last chapter in the book of Acts. I'm probably going to try to finish it up. Teaching a Bible, you always kind of try to figure out how, how many verses should I cover or, or uh, just take one at a time. Some, some are real detailed, others just try to hit as much as you can. Okay, Acts 28, and let's go ahead and pray. Lord, I do ask you to help us now as uh, have an open book in front of us. And Lord, I believe with this book with all my heart, and I do ask you to help us to understand it, help us to know how to apply it. And help us to be faithful to your words. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, the title of the book is The Acts of the Apostles. Not Christians in particular, even though the apostles were Christians. But the Acts of the Apostles, and we're going to get down to uh, verse 28, 29, where that's where God officially blinds the nation of Israel uh, worldwide. Okay, where he seemed like he hit four installments. One was in Jerusalem, the others in Judea, and the other Samaria, and then the uttermost part of the earth. So it's kind of four installments. And so he's already done the first three, Jerusalem at the death of Stephen, and then Judea in Acts, I think, 11, and then uh, Samaria, Acts 18, and then Acts 28 is going to be international. And this is why the nation of Israel, uh, even though Jews were writers of the Bible, uh, to, to this day, uh, the Jews know very little about the Bible. Meaning, Old Testament, they know very little about the Old Testament. They know about the Talmud, but the Old Testament they know nothing about. And that's because of their blindness. Now, the warning of that to the church in Romans 11 is that uh, we better not boast against the branches because of their blindness, because church, you're doing the same thing. Okay, and the church across America has done the same thing. Okay, and they're just as blind about the scriptures as the Jews are. So we're in chapter 28. Paul is on his extradition trip from uh, Israel to Rome. Uh, the ship uh, sunk in uh, the previous chapter. They've landed on an island. Okay, and so we're going to see that uh, God right off the bat, is going to exalt Paul to a position of admiration and influence. And then God's going to use that for the three months while he's there to uh, preach the gospel to these people. Acts 28, verse 1, And when they were escaped okay, from the boat, from the ship, then they knew that the island was called Melita. And you can get a Bible map to look where that's at. And the barbarous people showed us no little kindness. Okay, barbarous, we say the barbarian. Okay, showed us no little kindness. Funny way to write that. But uh, they were uh, helping these uh, 276 people on the boat that landed. Okay, that came into shore. And this tribe of people uh, was reaching out and trying to help them. And it was very cold. Because it would have been late, very late, maybe November, around that time, because they were thinking about wintering there. Uh, It says, For they kindled a fire and received us, every one, because of the present rain and because of the cold. And when Paul had gathered a bundle of sticks, oh, look at there, Paul's uh, somebody that's being a servant. He just didn't say, Go get that, go get this, and go get that. You know, he did, he went out and got it. Okay, so he is a, a worker just like everybody else. He's gathered a bundle of sticks and laid on them, uh, and laid them on the fire. And there came a viper out of the heat and fastened on his hand. So we got a snake bite. And uh, this is not uh, like the churches down in Tennessee, Kentucky, West Virginia, where they get out the snakes, you know, and they handle the snakes and. And then I'm going to put a little drop of arsenic in the glass because, gee, we can treat any deadly thing. Look at this. Uh, and we can handle these snakes. Watch this. Uh, they never handle King Cobra, that's for sure. Okay, and they're just playing around with them snakes, what they're doing. And, uh, no, this is not Paul uh, testing snakes. He's just going about his business of trying to get the fire going, and a snake came out and got him. Verse 4, and when the barbarian saw the venomous beast hang on his hand, so he obviously picked the thing up, 
And uh, they said among themselves, no doubt this man is a murderer, whom, though he hath escaped the sea, yet vengeance suffereth not to live. So, in the mind, how did these barbarians know the death penalty upon murder? Did they have a Bible? They didn't have a Bible. Okay, they knew this. How? From the revelation of God. Only educated America, Americans, you know, don't have the ex death sentence for murderers. You know, they'll house them for 15, 20 years. Okay, and so they know that. Now, at this point, they see that. They think this is a judgment on this man, Paul. Verse 5, he shook off the beast into the fire and felt no harm. And probably went about his business. And probably just kept doing stuff, trying to help people out, trying to get them warmed up. And no doubt these guys were watching him like a hawk. It was like a magnifying glass. Okay, and that's the thing. When uh, our faith is made known, a magnifying glass will come up between you and those people, and they will watch you like a hawk from then on out. And in this case, uh, they're watching him, keeping track of him. Verse 6, Howbeit they looked uh, when he should have swollen or fallen down dead suddenly, but after they had looked a great while, they saw no harm come to him. They changed their minds and said that he was a god, lowercase. So the evidence is what made them change their minds. And, and when we see evidence, we should change our minds if we have a certain mindset. Okay, and what they're doing in verse 4 is they have one mindset. This, this is all against this guy. And then this guy didn't die, so now they got a second alternative. And that's, that's true about anything in life. Okay, is remember to look at both sides. It's good not to draw a conclusion about anyone or anything unless you see the pros and the con. Okay, they say that the pros is opposite of con, and so the progress, the opposite of that is Congress. You know, think on that one for a while, and there's a lot of truth in that one. Okay, but there's always different sides to a story. If you go to a court and listen to one side, you're going to think, oh, wow, that guy's guilty. And then you hear the other side. Oh, now I'm kind of wondering. And the Bible says, he that answereth a matter before he heareth it, it is folly and shame unto him. And so we got to recognize, don't draw a conclusion just from one side. Okay, give it some time, and if you have some opportunity, to try to get the other side. But notice how people change. From one minute, he's a devil, to the next minute, he's a god. In Acts chapter 14, it did the complete opposite. When Paul and Silas, Paul and Barnabas, Acts 14, healed some people, they said, they're a god, they're a god, and then... They were going to have a sacrifice and, and, and slay a lamb in front of them to commit this sacrilege. And Paul and, and Barnabas ran amongst them and said, no, we're just like you are. And then they turned around and said, you're a devil, you're a devil. It was that quick. And that's how people are. And you just got to relax with it. So they changed their minds when they saw a different viewpoint. And we ought to be willing to do that. They changed their mind that quick. Like the Apostle Peter Verse 7, it says, In the same quarters were possessions of the chief man of the island. Okay, so this is like the chief of the tribe. This is Often this is the influence on that group, okay, or on that people. If you've got a good leader at the top, generally the people will follow that. If you've got a bad leader, then everybody else is going to be tyrants. So they have a good man at the top, a chief of the of man of the island, whose name was Publius. Uh, who received us and lodged us three days courteously. So he is a real hospitable individual. So the people follow that, uh, that testimony, that example. And it came to pass that the father of Publius lay sick of a fever and of a bloody flux, to whom Paul entered in and prayed and laid his hands on him and healed him. So when he was done, others also which had diseases in the island came and were healed. Now this is the method that God used in this circumstance, okay? The ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ was healing, the gift of healing, and then people on occasion listened to his messages. 
but it was healing and then took care of them physically and then hopefully they will take, pay attention spiritually. Okay, with Paul it's the same thing here. Now remember the gift of healing has not been taken away from him yet. That occurs at the end of the chapter. After this chapter he writes in 2 Timothy that he left Miletum sick. Okay, or Trophimus sick in Miletum. He left him sick there. Why didn't he heal him? It's because that occurred after Acts 28. Okay, now we don't have the gift of healing. But there are some unique techniques that God graciously has been showing us through the years that the medical fo folks are not going to tell us about. You know, and, and some of the techniques that Morris has showed us. And this is a means that we can use to help somebody physically and then hopefully they would pay attention spiritually. Okay, how many uh, blind that Jesus healed gave them their eyesight and then they used their eyes to look at something maybe vulgar later on? Who knows? We don't know. Okay, but that could be. But this is kind of a method that we can be alert to in this realm Okay, we don't have the gift of healing, but there are some things that God has revealed to us, showed us some things that can help people outside of the medical profession. Okay, and thank God for that. And we want to reach out and help them so that possibly they will consider the gospel of Jesus Christ. Verse 10, he says, Who also honored us with many honors, and when... We departed, they laid at us with such things as were necessary. So try to help them along the way. And after three months, we departed in a ship of Alexandria. So here these guys were, this is what's called in, in the olden days is to winter at a place. Can't get on the boats, the water's uh, too cold, everything, so you get possibly ice along the shores. Okay, and so they're stuck there for three months and they just got to deal with life. In chapter 27, it was an unusual coincidence that a ship from Alexandria was sailing to Rome. Now, I know it's a ship from Alexandria. It's not a Bible translation. And in chapter 25, we have another ship from Alexandria that's going to sail to Rome. Coincidentally, in the Bible version issue, we have the first one, revised version. It came from the manuscripts of Alexandria, came through Rome, and that's the first English translation. Then everyone since then has been the same Alexandrian ship, but then them Alexandrian ships sink and go by the wayside. Okay, the Thomas Nelson Publishers, a famous publishing company that people don't, they, they don't know the underhandedness of them. If they owned the rights to the American Standard Version, then it went belly up, bankrupt. Then they bought the rights to the Revised Standard Version, and it went bankrupt. And they own the rights to the New King James Version, and they've got their fam the famous 666 on the title page. Okay, and, and like the NIV is owned by um, a book company that produces a lot of pornography, sells a lot of material of the Sodomites, uh, owned by Rupert Murdoch. The NIV. Okay, a lot of times people don't recognize those things. Okay, and so uh, the King James Bible is the only one that you can publish without worrying about anybody suing you for copyright. It's the only one. Any church can just pick up the King James Bible and start printing it and start passing it out, and you don't have to worry about copyright. You can't do that with the NIV and New American Standard, now all these new fangled ones, New King, you can't do that. I think the NIV, if you use more than 500 verses, you've got to write uh, the society in Colorado Springs to get their permission. Because they got that copyrighted. Okay, that's just a little sidebar. Verse 11, And after three months we departed in a ship of Alexandria, which had wintered in the isle, whose sign is Casker and Polex, and landing at Syracuse, we tarried there three days, and from thence we fetched a compass and came to whatever that is, real gilium, and after one day, the south wind blew, and we came to the next day. Uh, came the next day to uh, Putkoli. So he's just charting out his uh, the where he's traveled, and you can get a Bible map to see how this followed. Okay, it says where we found brethren, 
And we desired to stay with them seven days, and so we went together toward Rome. And from thence, when the brethren heard of us, they came to meet us as far as Api Forum and the three taverns. Okay, now taverns in our culture is a bad connotation. Okay, when we think of tavern, what are we thinking of? Is a bar. Okay, and so we can, you know, just a person can say, well, they went to a tavern, so let's go soak the suds. The Bible says so. It's like one guy told me, he said, didn't in the Old Testament they had smoke in the temple? I'm feeling the temple of God. <laughs> and so everybody's got a different viewpoint about those things. At least this wasn't the weed, it was the ciggy. Okay, but everybody looks at it differently. Okay, the three taverns. we got to look at it from the Bible perspective. Let the, ta- let the Bible determine its own definitions. The word tavern is a King James only word. All the new Bibles change it. But it's a word for an inn. We would say a motel. Possibly a hotel. Maybe a bed and breakfast. Something like that. Okay, that's where they were going. The three taverns whom when Paul saw, he thanked God and took courage. And when we came to Rome, the centurion delivered the prisoners to the captain of the guard, but Paul was suffered to dwell by him with a soldier that kept him. So Paul has developed a relationship with this guard, and the guard is trusting him, and he's trusting the guard back and forth. 17, it came to pass that after three days, Paul called the chief of the Jews together. Okay, remember Paul said we preach the Gospels to the Jews first and also to the Greeks. That's Paul's burden. So we can see that Jews are now up in the Roman area. They've been scattered. Okay, and uh, so he's going to call them and try to talk to them, tell them about his situation. He don't know what they know. Maybe they've heard the wrong things, and so he's just trying to get a meeting with these folks. It says, And when they were come together, he said unto them, Men and brethren, though I have committed nothing against the people or customs of our fathers. Now that's the word that he's using, customs. He's used that back in Acts also. Okay, if, or earlier in Acts 21. Uh, the idea of customs, where the Old Testament law, you have basically three distinctions of the law. You have a civil aspect, okay, you have a moral aspect, and then you have a ceremonial aspect or customs. That's where the customs fall under. The ceremonial aspect would be many of the sacrifices and the washing of the pots and pans, a lot of the religious things that they did. The civil aspect would be the punishment against thievery or murder or rape and things like that. That would be the civil aspect. That would be what the Jewish people as a nation would need to uh, order or follow through. Many of those civil aspects are found in there. Okay, And so uh, and a perfect example of a tort or a liability is that if somebody had dug a pit and they didn't put a fence around it, and somebody came along and fell in the pit. That's a civil offense. That's a liability. That's a tort. And the owner was responsible for not putting a fence around it. Okay? You find that in Exodus. You find a bunch of other little goofy things in Exodus. Okay? And they're civil. Okay? The civil one would be like the death sentence. Where the death sentence, if a person says, well, so-and-so murdered somebody, I'm just going to go execute him because the Bible says I can. No, they had certain procedures that if, if there was a death involved in a person that uh, possibly committed a crime or maybe not a crime, depending on the situation, he could run to one of the uh, cities where they, he, nobody can go in and get them. Cities of refuge are called. They had six of them. And then they would have a trial. Okay, and on the trial, if the guy was found guilty, then the next of kin of the one murdered would execute the punishment. Okay, if a brother got murdered, his brother could be the one that, to the murderer. If it's an out-and-out murder, if not an accidental death, not just dying because they got in a fist fight. 
Okay, and that's that's what they did on on, on the Jewish code. That's the ser- civil aspect. The moral aspect would be: Thou shalt not covet. Thou shalt not uh, steal. Uh, those things are all repeated. The ten, the basic ten commandments are pretty much all of them repeated by the Apostle Paul, except one. One is not mentioned by Paul. Uh, in particular, and that would be honor the Sabbath day and keep it holy. That was a specific sign between God and Israel. Now, if an American wants to think you're spiritual because you're going to keep the Sabbath, have at it. I don't care. Okay? Take a rest on Friday night from 6 to Saturday night at 6. Have a good time. Okay? Uh, I, but it's not a mark of spirituality. It's not a sin to do it. It's not a sin not to do it. Okay? The basic principle in America is that when things were shut down on Sunday, that was a good principle. You don't find that anymore. It's a rare thing that you find that anymore. America was better off when Americans on Sunday shut everything down and went to church. And they, they is a good principle of resting. But specifically, the Sabbath itself is a special sign between God and Israel. Not the church, not Gentiles. Okay, and that one is not repeated by the Apostle Paul. He does mention the Sabbath. One time he mentions, let no man judge you in respect of a holy days or of the new moons or of Sabbath days. So again, if somebody, uh, a believer in Jesus, wants to celebrate some of these Jewish customs... I don't care. That's fine. That's fine with me. Okay, they want to wear their little beanie. That's fine. Go to the Wailing Wall, pray. Fine, hunky dory. I went to the Wailing Wall and I got me a beanie. Okay, they have cardboard beanies right there for you if you didn't have a baseball hat or something like that. And it's just a little cardboard beanie. It didn't have the copter on top, but uh, you know, you at least get that part. Okay, and that's in Israel because that's the closest they can get to what, where they believe the temple should be. Okay, and so <clears throat> that's why Paul mentioned the customs. The custom is of our father, Jewish fathers, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. We use the same custom here, founding fathers. Founding fathers of America. Okay, not founding mothers. And so that's the same custom we use as far as that designation. It says, yet was delivered prisoner from Jerusalem into the hands of the Romans, who, when they had examined me, would have let me go because there was no cause of death in me. Okay, so the governing authorities, the judicial authorities, was going to let Paul go free. But when he made the statement, I appeal to Caesar, they had to follow his wishes. And this still is a lot of things that take place in court. A lot of people get in trouble... By their mouth. And the thing is, is the less you talk, the better off it is. And in this case, Paul could, should not really have said, I appeal to Caesar. He could have saved this trip. But when you get under pressure, when you're in a court setting, sometimes you just blurt out, and he blurt out, and here, and this, it let those guys off the hook is what it did. They didn't have to. This a lot of the, the one reason why divorce cases drag out so much is because a judge doesn't want to make the decision, and they keep dragging out, dragging out, dragging out, hoping to wear out both parties where they finally they finally come to an agreement. Okay, and it depends how adamant both parties are. Okay, some just say, "I'm tired of it. Just take the car." Okay, well, that settled that. And then it's over real quick. I know a man that went through the child custody thing for almost 10 years before he finally was able to get his son. Why? Because they could not get both parties to agree. And he just kept adamantly trying to get it. And and I knew both sides of the story on this one. He most definitely should have gotten one. And this one, this side, I don't know about that one. Okay, and so... They drag it up. But Paul made the statement, I appeal to Caesar. Now they've got to follow his wishes. So verse 19. And when the Jews spake against it, I was constrained to appeal unto Caesar. 
not that I had ought to accuse my nation of. For this cause, therefore, have I called for you to see you and to speak with you, because that for the hope of Israel I am bound with this chain. And they said unto him, We neither receive letters out of Judea concerning thee, neither any of the brethren that came showed or spake any harm of thee. Okay, so, hey, they haven't heard a thing. Now it's square one. He's got a blank slate. Praise the Lord. Let's see how this turns out. So then they said, We desire to hear of thee what thou thinkest. For as concerning this sect, they've heard about that. This sect, this thing coming through the book of Acts. We know that everywhere it is spoken against. Okay, we know, boy, it's, we're uncertain about this. And when they had appointed him a day, they came many to him into his lodging, to whom he expounded and testified the kingdom of God, persuading them concerning, there's the magical word, Jesus. That's the word that they don't like to hear. That's the word you, uh, if you're going to utter that in the streets of Jerusalem, get ready to get a rock thrown inside you. Jesus. Okay, and what a person, uh, if you ever get stuck in that situation, deal with a Jew, talking Bible, I would not recommend using the word Jesus or saying that word Jesus. I would show a lot of the prophecies. Okay, this was predicted here. He's going to be born. He's going to be raised. I'd show all those things. I said, hey, do you know of anybody that's ever fulfilled any of those eight out of those? No. I said, well, I know one. Really? And then get ready to duck when you say, Jesus Christ. <laughs> Okay, because they don't like that name. But when you give them all the characteristics, if you've led them step by step by step by step and say, how do you deal with that? Jesus Christ met every one of those. And now they're face to face with Jesus. And that's what Paul's doing. He's gone through the Old Testament scriptures. It says both out of the law of Moses, so he showed him the Passover lamb, he showed about Noah and the ark. It's got one door on there. He showed about Joseph being betrayed by his brothers. He showed him that. Okay, out of the law and out of the prophets. He showed him Isaiah 53, which is forbidden to read. He showed him Psalms 22, which is forbidden to read in Israel. He showed him that from morning to evening. Boy, they spent all day talking about this. And I'll bet you there were some, some voices that really raised up going on. Those Jews get yelling about things. And so he said, look at the scriptures, look at the scriptures. Kept them going back to the scriptures. And say, how do you refute this? And Micah, he said he's going to be born in Bethlehem. What are you going to do with that? And Zechariah says, they looked upon him whom they pierced. And that's the Lord, that's Yahweh, that's Jehovah. How, what are you going to do with that? He was pierced. Okay, and then to bring up the Nazareth idea. And then bring up all these different prophecies and let them deal with it. That's what proves the Bible is the prophecies. So what's the response? Verse 24, and some believed. Praise the Lord. Some believed the things which were spoken and some believed not. Hey, you're not going to win them all. You say, what's the difference? Usually the word pride. That's usually the difference. Uh, the ones that don't believe is probably thinking, boy, oh boy, what's mom and dad going to say if I believe this? They're going to think about family. They're going to think about, boy, if I go this route, whew, I don't know about that. So some believed, some did not. And when they agreed not among themselves, they could not get a consensus among them. They departed. And after that, Paul had spoken one word, well spake the Holy Ghost by Isaiah the prophet unto our fathers. He said, here's what Isaiah said. Okay, now this verse is Isaiah chapter 6, if you want to go back and look at it. Isaiah chapter 6 is a verse that is uh, quoted or cited in Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, and Romans, and Hebrews, seven times. It is probably the most quoted verse in the New Testament. Seven times. 
And it shows the natural law of progression, the law of entropy of life, is that with time, everything towards, towards disorder. Everything's falling apart. What's happened in America? It's falling apart. What's going to happen in America? It's going to die. That's a law of life. That's just a law of life. America is following the same pattern Sodom followed, the same pattern Israel followed, the same pattern Rome followed, the same pattern Babylon followed. At the end of all those nations, sodomy was in the church or the Jewish temple. That's where we're at. You know, on Wednesday nights, Jan and I pick up several of the young children in our area, the bus kids. I am shocked with what these kids are being taught and talked about. They talk about things that I did not know when I was 20 years old about, you know, the opposite sex and things like that. Not a clue. And the number one thing is, uh, oh, that's racist. That's racist. They've got that emotional charge being pumped to them in the schools. If you say, well, there's a Mexican. Oh, that's racist. Well, what do you want me to say? There's a person. I mean, they got this all emotionally charged up and they don't even look. Racism is an emotional issue of the last argument. When somebody cries racial tension, racial problems, that's because they ran out of all their arguments. A person who is adjusted in their race, no matter what, doesn't care about it. I, can you imagine? There was a white guy that was very, very good at basketball, basketball handling. And, I mean, he was a Canadian, and he was so good, he'd play like four or five guys and beat them. He'd often travel and, and do talks. He tried out for the Hardham Globetrotters. Wrong color. And they admitted he was so good that they'd like to get him, but you're wrong color. Now, is that going to hit the news media? No, they're not going to talk about that on the news media. He would stand out in front jokingly and say, the Hardham Globetrotters are racist. They won't let a white guy play on their team. <laughs> Well, they would let them play on the generals who always lost, but they wouldn't let them be a Harlem Globetrotter. Can you imagine if an all-white team went around and tried to go to these public schools, you know? Oh, they'd be branded white supremacists. I mean, I mean, all this racism that these kids are being taught, they're not dealing with reality. And the perversion that these kids are seeing I mean, just what these kids were talking on our van last night. My wife is trying to counsel them. What? This is going on in school. And it's an amazing thing. And these are 10, 10 year old, they're little five year old girls on a bus, and these kids are just throwing this stuff out there. Transgender, what is that? <laughs> these kids are talking that stuff at that age. And that's because our society is falling apart. You know, and this is small town Rensselaer. What's it like in the inner cities? Small town Rensselaer. You know, and it's just, it's just a shame where we see. And what this is, this is Isaiah chapter 6, verse 9 and 10. This is the end of every age. This is what God told Isaiah. He said, Isaiah, I want you to go preach. He said, okay, where do you want me to go? Here's what I want you to do. He said, how long am I going to preach? Until nobody listens to you. Until they're done. Isaiah 6, verse 9. He said, go and tell this people. Hear ye indeed, but understand not. And see ye indeed, but perceive not. Make the heart of this people fat. Make their eyes heavy. Shut their eyes, lest they see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and convert and be healed. It's about like saying, Lord, you want me to go tell these people? He said, yeah. He said, they're going to listen? He said, no. Then why waste the time? Because I told you. Uh, how about Ezekiel 33? Ezekiel was another fellow. You want to know why the average contemporary church in about a two-hour service, or if they go two hours, let's say an hour and a half service, an hour and 15 minutes will be music and announcements, and they'll give a little sermonette for the Christianettes so they can go home and smoke their cigarettes. 
They don't, they don't know preaching. Joyce Meyer's got more manhood than Joel Olstein. I mean, it's amazing. Why? Ezekiel 33 tells us why. This is the end of Ezekiel's ministry. And he said this in verse 30. He said, Also thou son of man, the children of thy people still are talking against thee by the walls and in the doors of the houses. He said, Ezekiel, you are popular. Boy, are they talking about you. And speak one to another, every one to his brother, saying, Come, I pray you. And hear what is the word that cometh forth from the Lord. Well, that sounds good. And they come unto thee as, a peop- as the people cometh. And they sit before thee as my people. And they hear thy words. But they will not do them. He said, they're going to listen to you. But they're going to walk out the door and do what they want. They're not going to do them. For with their mouth they show much love. Oh, I love God. But their heart goeth after their credit card. Covetousness. And lo, thou art unto them as a very lovely song, one that playeth a, hath a pleasant voice and can play well on an instrument. Ezekiel evidently had a real talent in music. They'd love to come and hear him sing. And you can see this out street preaching. If you go out street preaching, you have some folks that sing very well. You start singing, people will come in. And then you start preaching, and people will go out. And so some guys say it's a viol- it's the uh, accordion effect. So we get them in by the singing, and then they get them out by the preaching. And we just go back and forth and back and forth. Okay, and so that's how it goes. It says, for they hear thy words, but they do them not. And when this cometh to pass, lo, it will come. Then shall they know that a prophet hath been among them. They're going to know there's a man there. You see, and that's how it goes. They're not going to, they're not going to, there's a fellow down at Rensselaer. He, every once, about, once every six months, he might show up at Rensselaer. He always went to the Catholic Church. He always pestered Father Alt. He'd listen to me on the radio all the time. This guy would listen to me on the radio, then he'd go pester Father Alt. And then he'd t- talk to me. He said, you are the only preacher in town that tells the blankety-blank truth. Now, I won't repeat what he said before the truth. I said, well, okay, I guess I'll take that as a compliment. And that's how it goes. Okay, but he never came to church. He would listen on the radio and laugh, but then he would never... And there's a lot of Dutchmen down here in Damat that will listen to this Dutch kid on that radio. I catch wind of so many of them, but are they going to leave the Dutch Reformed when it's gone contemporary and show up? No, they're not going to do it. But at least they're going to hear it by the grace of God. And so this is Acts 28, verse 26 and 27. He's repeating Isaiah. Our verse for that is found in Romans 11. This one is for Israel. He's, white. He's getting done with Israel. Israel's done internationally. So it says, Go unto this people and say, Hearing ye shall hear and shall not understand, seeing ye shall see and not perceive, for the heart of this people is wax gross, and their ears are dull of hearing. They're tired of listening. And their eyes have been closed, they closed, Lest, lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and should be converted, I should heal them. The verse for the New Testament church is Revelation 3, verse 20. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. The Lord is outside the church door. If any man hear my voice. Notice the Lord didn't say when any man. He says, if any man hears my voice. Individual basis. This church, this church, this one here, this one here. If any man hear my voice, I will come into him and will sup with him. I'll talk to him. Nobody else. When their heart is open to it. Acts 28, 28, he says, Be it known therefore unto you that the salvation of God is sent unto the Gentiles, and that they will hear it. That's it. That's the final, last straw for Israel. Okay, and the next time he's going to get their attention, it's going to come during the tribulation or Jacob's trouble. And that's still going to be a small remnant. 
The next verse is removed from all the new Bibles, just taken out. It says, And when he had said uh, these things, the Jews departed and had great reasoning among themselves. I don't know why they take it out, but it's gone. And so what did Paul do? Paul dwelt two whole years in his own hired house. So it's like a house arrest, what he's like, what he's under. It's a house arrest and received all that came in unto him. So they had to come to him because he was not allowed to leave. Two years. And so what is he preaching? Preaching the kingdom of heaven? Nope, kingdom of God. He defines that Romans 14, 17. The kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and joy and peace in the Holy Ghost. The kingdom of God is within you. So that's the kingdom we are to be preaching today. The kingdom of God, the Lord Jesus Christ, the gospel of Jesus Christ, the new birth, and teaching those things which concern the Lord Jesus Christ. Not the Baptist faith, not the Methodist faith, not the catechism, not all these things. We teach about the Lord Jesus Christ With all confidence. Why? Because he's the only one who's worthy. With all confidence. Confidence in the scriptures and no man forbidding him. Okay, so that's the end of the book of Acts. And uh, that's uh, as far as God is concerned. Then you get into Romans. And so Romans sets up the standard for the church. And then you got Romans to Philemon is the standard for the church, and anything in the Bible that would contradict it, you take Paul's writings over that, doctrinally speaking. We study the Bible from cover to cover, but we recognize that we need to understand our doctrine for a different time period. Okay, that's about 5-2. We'll stop there. Any questions?